We're going to uh, resume resume our, our, our program with our first our, our first conversation of, of the weekend. Uh, you'll be served dessert during during our discussion, and please continue to munch uh, away. Our, our format this evening will be a conversation, a conversation, uh, not only amongst uh, <coughs> between Morty and, and Tom, uh, but also uh, amongst all of us. So uh, we're, we're going to start with some, uh, a question and some in introductory comments, uh, talk for 15, 20 minutes, and have a chance to, uh, for all of us to, to ask questions and participate in, in the conversation. The topic tonight is Williams and Williams in a global context. Uh, Williams as, as one of the leading providers of liberal arts education in, in the world. What's its role in, in an increasingly internationalized context? Um, a couple ground rules uh, as far as as far as questions uh, between my, my two our two guests here. Or, it's not fair to call Morty a guest, but uh, but our two our two panelists uh, uh, th this evening uh, they could talk on a variety of subjects, ranging from baseball to uh, the stock market to global warming. Uh, I, I ask you to, if we can, to put some guardrails on our questions and try to keep them. Uh, on globalization and, and liberal arts education and, and Williams. And, that, and that's a pretty big box, but if we can stay in that box, it would be very much uh, appreciated. It gives me great pleasure to be sitting uh, on this stage with two uh, very accomplished individuals. Uh, immediately to my left is, is Tom Friedman. Uh, we all know Tom, if not in person, we know him in print. Uh, he is a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, the publisher of many books that I'm sure at least uh, that everyone in this room has read at least one of, the most recent being The, the world, is, world is Flat. Hot, flat, and crowded. Hot, flat, and crowded. <laughs> I'm, I'm a book behind. <laughs> I have to, I'm, I'm, Lex, I'm back on the Lexus. I've got to catch up. I'm, I'm slow. You know, we, uh, we division, two, <laughs> division two majors are behind. Um, I wasn't an English major, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, again, Tom is a, a parent, uh, Tom and Anne are parents of a uh, Williams Jr., Natalie, who's here this evening, and uh, we're just absolutely delighted to have Tom Friedman here this Thank evening. You. Thank you. Uh, we all know Morty as well. Morty uh, is one of, in addition to being president of this, of this wonderful place, uh, Morty is a, as you all know, a, a leading scholar in higher education. Uh, he has published uh, numerous books, articles uh, on the subject, and uh, he has, and he practices what he preaches as far as what he's done for Williams in, in his nine years here. He's made Williams a much more international place, a much more diverse place. Uh, he has diversified our curriculum. He has exposed Williams students and faculty uh, to the world and brought the world to Williams. And I can't imagine two better panelists to be talking about Williams, the liberal arts education, and our increasingly globalized world. So we'll start with a, with a question for you, Tom. Um, if if <clears throat> looking uh, uh, at, at the world and, and the changes that are, that are uh, happening in, in increasing warp speed, what do you feel uh, the group of students here and the group of students that will be graduating, what challenges do you think they'll be facing uh, as they uh, emerge into the world today five years from now that would be different than, say, five years ago, ten years ago? Well, first of all, Greg, thank you for having me. Morty, thank you for having me. It's always a treat uh, to be back here uh, at Williams. Um, uh, I met Morty seven, eight years ago, I think, when he invited me to be a graduation speaker here. I'd never been to Williams. Uh, fell in love with it, um, insisted my daughter uh, come at least look at it, and, um, <laughs> and the, re the, deal, the rest right? is history. So it, it's, a, it's a treat to be with you here this evening. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I don't, if, if I could rephrase your Please question do. slightly, right, you know, which is really just thinking about, um, uh, and I, I'm a trustee of Brandeis, which is my alma mater, so I think about all these issues a lot. My wife is an educator also. You know, what are the skills you really want to um, uh, endow in a young person today uh, <clears throat> from uh, a four-year education? And... Um, Whenever I think of that, um, uh, I, I, one thing really um, first and foremost comes to my mind, and that is the ability to learn how to learn. Um, uh, because basically everything is changing at warp speed. 
and what you learn today, whether it's in chemistry or, or biology or in computer science um, or in finance, is going to be different tomorrow uh, or in six months or in five years. And therefore, uh, for me, I've always felt that the single most important competitive advantage that any college could endow uh, its students with very broadly is the ability to learn how to learn. So I, I, um, when uh, I wrote The World is Flat, I was actually giving a talk about this out in uh, Minneapolis, my hometown. And um, uh, I made this point in, in, in my talk. And uh, a young man in the balcony stood up during question time. He, was in, uh, he identified himself as being in ninth grade. And he said to Mr. Freeman, it was very, 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 very interesting, what course do I take to learn how to learn? Um, <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and I just thought, you know, from the mouths of babes, you know, what a, what a great question. And, uh, and I think the answer really applies to, to Williams and every great school. Uh, on, on one leg, I, I don't know where this came from, but I said to him, you know, I thought about it for a second. I said, you know, uh, really this is, would be my, my strategy. I said, um, go around to all your friends and ask them uh, who their favorite teachers are. And just make a list and take all their courses, no matter what they're teaching. Astrophysics, Russian literature, biology, American history, it doesn't matter. Because I think the place where you uh, learn how to learn is by loving how to learn and, and loving learning. And I think where you get that, some people are fortunate enough to be born with it, but I think uh, where you get that most is from great teachers who really inspire and uh, instill and, uh, and bring that out of you. Because that really makes you want to do, great teachers really make you want to learn, they, they really want, make you want to produce, um, as do great editors. You know, there's really only two words in life, and I'll stop here, but it really applies to teachers and editors. There's two kind of, excuse me, managers in life, and there are those who say yes and those who say no, okay? Um, that is, the, the great teacher says, yes, but, you know, that's a great idea for your paper. Yeah, but I, I just might formulate it, you know, I just might put that edge. You might want to, yes, that's great, but go to, and then there's the editor who says, no, no, that's a bad idea. You know, and there's just yes people and no people in the world. And the great teachers and the great editors are all yes people. Great. Morty, could you follow up on, on that and, and talk a little bit about, about Williams and given the, um, the introduction from, from Tom, how Williams and where Williams is heading uh, <clears throat> delivers on, on the learn, teaching kids how to learn. I'm happy to try. <clears throat> Everybody hear me? I feel like it's kind of a Star Trek kind of thing. Oh, no. It's <laughs> um, you know, I'm actually more interested in hearing Tom than hearing me. <laughs> no, um, but hearing we have you. a lot in common. We both write books. My books sell, uh, his books sell 5 million, and hard <laughs> copy mine sell 5,000. <laughs> So we both have the five in there. Yeah. Uh, although you don't buy all five million of yours. That's my, most of mine. Uh, which is why my closet is full, literally, of like more of my... Anyway, um, you know, I, I'm glad Tom added not just the uh, willingness to learn or the ability to continue to educate yourself, but the, the, the desire to do so. And I think one thing, Greg, as you know, you're both William's parents and... Tom also knows, because he teaches winter study, he did it two years ago, coming back again uh, next January, teaching a course called Great Teaching and Great Writing. Maybe later you can talk a little bit about why you put those two together, but those of us who are either writers or teachers, I think we understand where you're going with that. Uh, we have a brilliant faculty. I mean, I look out there, I see a number of them out there. They, they understand that their job is not just to teach you know, romantic poetry, or not just to teach uh, applied econometrics, but to really get people engaged in critical thinking skills. Uh, we want our students, we're very self-conscious, as you know, Greg, uh, in making sure our students are adept quantitatively, that they have confidence in public speaking, and that they can write. And I think that, uh, you know, the strange thing, and I think it was right before you joined the board, uh, we had a long discussion, I'm not going to point to the faculty member who ran that uh, with the strategic plan was Laurie Hetherington in psychology. Um, <laughs> you know, a long thing about, you know, we compete against schools that are wonderful schools without any requirements. And, you know, it works for them. You know, Amherst, Brown, Wesleyan, you know, they, they, you know, they get these great kids and they educate them in a way, but they don't feel like you have to identify certain kinds of skills that 
they want to mark if you graduate from that school that all potential employers, graduate, stu graduate school, professional school, you know, admissions people know that you have imprinted on you. But we felt different, and as a result of that, we not only kept, of course, the science requirements and all the other requirements, including the exploring diversity requirement, which we updated recently, but we actually added a quantitative adeptness um, you know, uh, requirement. We added writing intensive courses. And I think that it gets to what Tom was saying. You, know, you don't know for sure how the uh, employment markets and labor economies, how they're going to change over time, but we, history suggests certain kinds of skills are really going to serve someone well. If you're really adept quantitatively, if you're able to speak, if you're able to write, if you're comfortable with difference inside and outside the classroom, and if, you're, if you have role models, the kind of Williams faculty that instill not only you know, a willingness to continue to learn, but a love of that. And I think that's what we try to do with small classes, with tutorials, and the like. And, and given that, and we're all, we're, we're preaching to the converted here, uh, yeah. we're all products of a liberal arts education, uh, and given the acceleration of, 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 of communications and the, and the flattening of the world, um, and the need, therefore, to, to be able to communicate and write and analyze and change, I think, I think that I've seen statistics that our, our kids, the, the graduates will... Of, of Williams today will have somewhere between seven and nine jobs or careers. Uh, they'll be constantly having to reinvent themselves and it's hard to predict how the world's going to go. Given that and given the argument for liberal arts for that, uh, uh, for that model, why is liberal arts under siege in this country as far as the number of students who actually are entering <coughs> into, into liberal arts? Um, why are there other pressures that are narrowing liberal arts versus uh, expanding it? And then as a follow-up, I'm going to talk about internationally. What's, what we might see happening on, on the liberal arts stage inter internationally. Now, who would ever like to take, start with that one? You've won three Pulitzers, I've won none. <laughs> okay. You go first. Um, well, if liberal arts is under siege, I think that's very, uh, that's, that's, that's tragic, you know, because um, I think it's actually our uh, single most important competitive advantage, actually, uh, is that we do offer a liberal arts education um, and, and I'd say that for, for a couple reasons. One is that, um, you know, I really believe that, uh, you know, in, in, in what I like to call this flat world, you know, there's one overriding um, business law. Uh, and, and for me, it's uh, whatever can be done will be done. It, when the world is flat, whatever can be done will be done. The only question is, will it be done by you or to you, okay? <laughs> but just don't think it won't be done. Because when the world gets this flat and this interconnected, and there's so many distributed tools of innovation, if you have a good idea here in Williamstown, promise me you will pursue it. Because someone in New Delhi or Beijing or Williamsburg will do it a second later, okay? And so in that kind of world, um, I think the most important, <clears throat> single most important competitive advantage uh, economic, it, besides the ability to learn how to learn, beyond that is that I think the most important competition in the world going forward is no longer between countries and countries, although that's still happening and important, and it's no longer really between companies and companies. I think the single most important competition going forward is between you and your own imagination. Because what you imagine in a flat world really matters, because you can now act on your imagination as an individual, farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than ever before. If you get an idea, you can go to Amazon.com to do your fulfillment. You can go to Alibaba to hire a programmer in China or a manufacturer. You know, you can go to um, Freelancer.com to um, get someone to draw your logo. The really value add is the idea. Mm -hmm. Everything else now is being commoditized. So that comes back to liberal arts because, you know, where, do, where does inspiration come from? Where does creativity come from? Well, I think creativity comes most from people who have two distinctly different specialties and then bring them together. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, for me, what's most fun is sort of take the Middle East and then overlay it with uh, um, globalization and then maybe bring an environment element into it. 
And wow, you know, chances are you're going to come up with something that nobody else has come up with. Think about Leonardo da Vinci. He was a painter, an engineer, you know, an artist, a writer, and he actually brought all of those together. That was his genius, Mm -hmm. was he had these separate specialties, and he brought them together, and in the spark between the two was his great value add. Mm -hmm. Well, what does liberal arts do? It gives you that. It, It forces you to study French literature and Russian history and biology and, and math and, and, and all of these things it gives you all these different perspectives. And that's why you know, I would simply say that, uh, you know, I, I'm not in the school, uh, the declinist school that believes that, you know, we, we may lose the 21st century, but we're not going to lose it to China by default. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, they're going to have to earn it because... Um, we got, I think, a lot of the really good sauce still here. And, um, you know, there is this sort of impression out there that uh, Britain owned the 19th century, um, you know, America owned the 20th century, and China will own the 21st century. To which I I personally say, uh, not so fast. And, you know, I always like to tell people that my grandmother in Minnesota, Grandma Friedman, God, God, God bless her, um, Grandma Friedman used to sit in her rocking chair in the cold Minnesota winter, and she would say, Tommy, never cede a century to a country that censors Google. Okay, okay. Um, it, it's just a little thing Grandma Friedman used to say, you know. And um, so I'm not in, in an age when ideas and creativity are the most important advantage. Censoring Google, censoring YouTube, censoring the New York Times is a proxy for limiting people's ability to imagine. Mm -hmm. And in this world, you will pay for that. Mm -hmm. Morty? Tom, I'm supposed to be the funny one. Yes. Oh, you know? They didn't tell you that? That's right. You didn't read the briefing? I didn't read the briefing. <laughs> Grandma Friedman. Uh, I'm the funny one. Uh, uh, let me just say, you know, one thing, and you know from being on the board, Greg, that uh, we have been approached by one, two, three, four, five countries in the last 12 months to start mm-hmm. at Williams there. And uh, trust me, in Singapore, in India in China and elsewhere, they know that the kind of specialized training prepares people for the wrong century, as Tom said. So the interesting thing is, when you talk about the, the threats and the potential demise, in particular, less to the liberal arts and the liberal arts college, the residential liberal arts college that we have uniquely here in America, that the rest of the world has discovered that they need the adaptability, they need the creativity, they need the kind of kids that we produce at the Williams College as the world. So that's the interesting thing. Everybody wants Williams in their country. Uh, I think we are alluding to the facts that uh, in 1950, 20% of all the undergrads in America were enrolled at liberal arts colleges. It's now 1%. Hmm. Now, part of that is the big expansion of community colleges. Part of that is a major expansion of the public uh, research universities and a smaller expansion of the private research universities. And what do you would, would, yeah. would, a, would a university of, I don't know, Michigan State, would you consider that a liberal arts college? Or no, not? I consider that a research university, uh-huh. as the categorization right. is. Uh, you then can say, well, is it the same to major in English at Williams as Natty is right. and to major in Williams at Michigan State? Then you have to say, well, is it the subject or is it the way we do it? Right. And I think some of the right. things you were suggesting yeah. before led me to think it's the way we do it. It's the, the, it's the entry system of which sure. your daughter is yeah. a JA. Yeah. It's, it's the, uh, the intimacy. It's the tutorials. It's the fact that everyone lives here and everyone sees each other and there's comfortable, and as Jim Colosor says, uncomfortable learning. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the fact that our faculty are proud of their scholarship, but they're not confused about that, where that fits vis-a-vis their teaching. And we don't have graduate students to teach, except in these two small jewels of programs. Yeah. So we don't have the distractions, you know. I mean, I was at SC, mm-hmm. I was at Penn, on different faculties. There's a lot of things that take your attention away from undergraduate education. But the liberal arts college 
there's nothing that distracts you from it. And I think that's really the yeah. special. That's what makes it special. Yeah. And again, you look at the numbers, 20%, 1%, but then you think, well, what about Williams, right? Williams is, you know, in a, as highly selective as basically anywhere. Uh, we have the resources. We have the alumni body and their success and myriad fields. Uh, you know, what's going to happen to us? I mean, I think the worry more, Greg, is that the number of liberal arts colleges out there shrinks. And it isn't because they go out of business, it's that they change their mission. Um, there was a, some of you know, I have a colleague, Dave Brenneman, uh, who challenged 20 years ago the notion that we still had 540 liberal arts colleges. There's the Carnegie classification, there's research one, there's doctoral, there's liberal arts, and so we had 540. And no one looked at the 540 and they said, okay, they're like Williams, they might not be as prestigious, as selective, as rich, as old, whatever it is, but they're 540. And then David looked at it and said, well, my definition of a liberal arts college is, first of all, you have to have about half of the kids majoring in the liberal arts, English, art, history, classics, and not in business, accounting, marketing, nursing, those kinds of fields. And that eliminated a lot of the 540. And they can't be schools where they have as many graduate students as they have undergrads, and that eliminated more. And he said, you know what? There's not 540, there's only 212. And that study was redone two days ago, and it's now 136. Now, the difference between 540 to 212 to 136, they didn't go under. They just became little research universities, or they became business schools, or they became nursing schools. So I think where Greg's getting to is, you know, what, what, what is it about this great product that the rest of the world is discovering, but the United States seems to be, you know, content and, you know... Uh, President Obama, before President Clinton, I love this idea that everyone should get college. They all should go to, you know, a community, at least two years of community college. And that's great, but it, it further kind of, you know, makes people think that education is education. You know, it's a year of college versus where you got it. And I happen to think that the liberal arts, majoring in liberal arts is different than majoring in marketing. Uh, and then doing it at a small place where everyone has a chance to succeed and where there's an intensity inside the outside the classroom where you can't get outside, you have to get outside of your comfort zone um, is very different. So I do worry about that and I worry a little bit about Williams because, well, I don't, you know, I just think that, the, you know, how many liberal arts colleges do you need when the most talented young men and the women graduating high school think of us as an option as opposed to the research universities? And the number's getting smaller and smaller. And when this new thing came out, I saw it was 136. Uh, that's pretty scary. Hmm. It's interesting. This, this week, uh, I was reading the, the Wall Street Journal, and um, there was an article about the, the initial public offering market. And it maybe has a chance to, after being closed for a year, has a chance of opening. And the two companies they're talking about that w might test that market are companies called Rosetta Stone and Bridgepoint. Uh, both of which are either internet-based or other types of digital um, instruction or education. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about uh, new methods um, of, of delivery? I'm not just talking uh, distance, the traditional yeah. distance learning, but, but Tom, you talked about collaboration being incredibly important, not, not just collaborating with your neighbor in your entry, but with somebody in India or somebody in China. Uh, and can you talk a little bit about um, about that revolution and about how Williams students uh, can can continue to participate in in that type in that type of revolution? Where do you and where do you think it's heading? Well, you know, I think the um, emphasis that Morty's put on diversity here is uh, extremely important because, again, wh you know, what happens in in a flat world is that you can now compete, connect, and collaborate with anyone anywhere. And since all of us are smarter than one of us, um, the, what will differentiate one company from another is its ability to access that global platform, the best talent, anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. um, well, we kind of take teamwork you know, for granted. Yeah, it's great if you're on the basketball team or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the soccer team, and that's important. But it, it's also uh, important if, what Morty said, if, if you got stretched out of your comfort zone by living with, uh, learning with people from very different cultures. Uh, because there's a very good chance your first job out of school may be deputy assistant manager of supply chain for IBM. Mm -hmm. um, and that supply chain will be a 24-7 knowledge network 
that the project starts in the United States in Armagh, you know, from nine to five, and then moves, you know, over to the U over to the UK or the other way around, um, and then over to India, and then over to Japan, and then back to the United States. And so, learning those collaborative teamwork skills, I think, are going to be uh, again incredibly important in a world where, you know, again, whatever can be done will be done. Well, if what can be done is that I can access the best brain power anywhere in the world, then I'm going to do that because you can do it, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it better, faster than you will. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my friend Nandini Lakani, who runs Infosys, which is the cool. company where I, I really, um, uh, where, where the world is flat was born, has a saying that you win in the turns now. You win in the turns, and the turns are coming. The product turns are coming faster and mm -hmm. faster, mm -hmm. and companies win in the turns by leveraging global talent 24-7, and you need people who can play in the turns. Okay. Morty, I'll ask you to respond to sure. Williams yeah. in this, this new paradigm, um, but also it's, if we could get the first question teed up, Rob, I don't see you somewhere. If Morty can respond, then we'll, we'll start taking questions from, from all of you. Sure, Greg. I mean, I, I definitely agree with Tom, with the revolutions in communications and technology. It allows us to reach out in ways, as a faculty member, it sure is a heck of a lot easier for when I'm writing a paper with Mike to not have to send it FedEx or something, but, you know, or just the crazy ways you used to be able to attach files. I mean, it's just, or send disks we used to do in the mail. I mean, it's just, what a revolution, and for our students, too, and to be linked when they're on study abroad and all that. But the one thing I want to say is that for a place like Williams, I think that really bothered me. 15 or so years ago when the, when the whole revolution in technology and communications came, the first thing a lot of schools did was start for-profit subsidiaries. We did that at SC, Columbia, NYU, mm -hmm. everybody did that. And I, it's exactly the wrong thing. What would that be? What would well, they, they were trying to make money on it. And, what would and, it know, look people, like? What, what would a for-profit Well, they tried be? to, you know, kind of take their curriculum mm -hmm. and, and try to sell it I and see. some great works of things mm -hmm. and they try, you know, all that kind of distance learning, right, a way to make more money. And I, I think that, you know, first of all, most of it failed. But I think what I think of technology is I think of the things Tom, you know, was talking about. Also the ways I just could teach much better now. I mean, i just give you an example of that, you know, this week this article came out, you know, two days ago. The first thing I did was I sent it to my class, you know, and I didn't have to Xerox it and hand it out. I just said, did an email at Blackboard. It's so easy. You upload the thing. Whether I had the copyright or not, I'm not going to mention in front of Tom Friedman. But uh, somebody's a lawyer, so it's probably protected. But anyway, uh, this discussion. But, you know, you download the thing. And I've done this to your columns. And I, I hope that's okay to admit. Uh, hopefully you'll right. be flattered and not sue I'm, me. But, you know, I download the thing. <laughs> you, you and I know the New York Times says, do you have, yeah, 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 right, whatever. Yeah. You delete that. You download it into Blackboard. <laughs> and you just send it to everybody. And then in class today, we discussed it. You know, the other thing is problem sets. I used to spend, you know, you only get an hour and 15 minutes or so. I mean, I must have wasted 10 minutes of that hour and 15. You know, each class, handing out paper, collecting paper. We're arranging tutorials for two weeks. We did it all electronically. And it's just, you know, it just makes us much more efficient so that we could really focus on what we're good at, yeah. which is doing class discussion mm -hmm. and not just doing the handing out paper and everything. So for us, the Williams faculty... You know, we have just been transformed by technology in a way that has nothing to do with rate increasing revenue streams and in many cases doesn't have anything to do with sometimes we do it linking to students at other colleges, universities, and other countries. It's just, you know, it's been transforming. And I've been teaching since, you know, you know, 79. And I just think that over my career, how much more attention I could do and how much more contact I can have with my students by using Blackboard and email and downloading and all that. It's just been transforming, Greg. Mm. And now you kind of take it for granted, and the next generation of cohort of faculty, more related, that's the way of life. You know, and I, and I tell them the old stories, and, you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, sure, and Abe Lincoln was by the fire reading <laughs> board. You know, that's about the sympathy you get on this stuff. But, yeah. you know, as, as faculty members, you can talk to any Williams faculty member, and he or she, he or she can immediately tell stories about how we're much better as teachers because of the technology we've adopted. Here's a test. Are you on Facebook, Morty? Uh, I'm afraid no one would friend me. <laughs> no, I would, uh, Morty. I'd... Well, thank you. No. <laughs> I rejected you. Okay. Question. Do we have somebody teed up, Rob? Anywhere? A question? 
There's a bunch of hands. We have Would you please, um, uh, please, when you when you stand, take the mic and, and tell us who you are and address your question to either Morty or Tom or both. Hi, yes. I'm Dennis O'Shea from Class 77. Um, just be interested after the discussion of of liberal arts colleges and and their role in the, in the flat society to talk a little bit about the antithesis in the higher education spectrum. Uh, where do you see the research universities uh, contributing both in terms of uh, innovation and so forth, but also in terms of what they can contribute to uh, education for our, our young people? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, that's really for you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> well, you know, um, we have an ecosystem in this country, um, when it worked, um, uh, that went from uh, people in their garage to research universities to venture capital to effective capital markets. And that, that ecosystem, when it worked, uh, was the fastest in the world at translating innovation and ideas into products uh, that could be marketed and sold globally. And uh, to me, research universities are just a really critical part of that ecosystem. And, um, and it's something that when you do go to the Chinas and the Singapores, as uh, Morty alluded to, that's something they're very much copying, you know, that, that, that model. And they, they do understand that model. What they've lacked historically is the other parts of the ecosystem, the rule of law, the venture capital, and the transparent and effective capital markets. I, I would just say that Dennis works at Hopkins, and you have what, 800 million in sponsored research, you lead the world in sponsored, literally, literally leads the world, I think, in sponsored mm -hmm. research. I mean, you just think about the innovations that come out of a re research university like that, you know, from variants of the internet to every drug in the world, to, I mean, it's just staggering, the kind of stuff that your university produces. And, you know, that's great. I, I think that you, you offer opportunities that the smaller colleges can't. Uh, Mike and I wrote, once wrote a paper, and we, we, we noticed that uh, there were more majors or something. There was some ama amazing thing that there's, I think, more things you can major in at the University of Minnesota than uh, we had freshmen. Literally. I mean, it was like staggering. You know, it was just staggering. You know, all the variants of neuroscience alone was four pages or something. We got the cattle. I mean, it's just, you know, you could specialize in ways you can't, you know, obviously at a smaller school, you, you, the research output, not just in the sciences, but the humanities and the social sciences are amazing. Uh, you know, it, so it, it's funny, there aren't too many liberal arts colleges who have accepted those offers from the Singapores of the world or the Middle East to open up liberal arts colleges. Maybe we have our heads in the sand or maybe not, but there sure are a lot of research universities who have. And uh, some of it's been tough sledding, some of them have closed, but some of them are thriving. And I think that kind of reaching out. And I think, as Tom said, you know, we're trying to, I think now, export the liberal arts model, but we've already, for the last 20 years, been at least modestly successful in exporting the research university model. And it's different than what they do. Uh, you know, it really is. And I, I think it's, it really has helped the world, I think. Okay. Next question. Sir. Right here? Okay. Great, thanks. I'm David Hoffman. David Hoffman, class of 74. I was an art history major at Williams, but I run a global investment management firm, which I think is part of what's possible in liberal arts college. And what I see when I travel globally is that our ability as a liberal arts educated people to deal with risk and uncertainty is much higher than people are educated in more special things. I wonder how you do that in the sense of creativity and the desire to continue to learn. Uh, kind of out of my skill set. I, I, I've never really, no, it's a very legitimate and interesting question. I, um, I don't see how one would go with the other, but you're telling me they do and I find that fascinating, but I, uh, it doesn't unfortunately trigger anything in my own head, so. But not related to risk. Pardon me? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I see. Yeah. 
Although I think that's true of well-trained scientists too, I would say. You know, um, I don't think that's exclusive to liberal arts. I think that's, it's more just a general attitude, I think, of, of people who are curious and um, probably are successful in, in business and in finance and in science you know, for the same thing. So I'm just not sure liberal arts is, it would be the thing I would identify, but it may be. I, the only thing, I, I mean, I have a colleague, Ed Berger, many of you know, he's a incredible, you know, we have this unbelievable math department, he's one of them, and we certainly consider that liberal arts, right? And, and he, you know, Ed's thing is that creativity comes out of failure. In fact, he taught a course on this this past semester, and I think that you have a lot of opportunities to succeed at Williams, but you sure as hell have a lot of opportunities to fail. When you're in a tutorial and you write a bad paper because you were up all night, man, it's ugly. <laughs> and I'll tell you, and I think those kids learn more from the many failures sure. they have. We had a couple of failures in my class today. People weren't <laughs> properly prepared, yeah. and they knew they were failed, and, they, uh, mm -hmm. and I told the whole world that they did. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, so I think what happens is that you, know, you, you learn to be more creative. You learn not only to roll with the punches, but you learn to integrate better across disciplines, and I think that you experiment more. And I think you look at the amazing entrepreneurs. And what do we create at Williams? You know, we have entrepreneurs in, in K-12 education, in higher education, in the sciences, in law, in medicine. You know, Toby's here, Cleveland Clinic, one of the greatest heart surgeons in the history of the world. I mean, those are the kind of people, and the, they succeed in a whole realm of different fields. So what is it? You know, was it the water? Was it the mountains? Was it the dumb purple cow emblem? You know, what the hell? I, I think it was that... They got a lot of chances to succeed and to innovate and to fail. I really do. And that's something that comes with size, I think, more than, as Tom was saying, probably less specific to whether you major in, in you know, economics or, or classics or whatever, but more just the nature of a small residential liberal arts college. You know what I mean? Where people are encouraged to get outside their comfort zone. And you might be the greatest poet in the world, but you're not graduating Williams without passing our quantitative requirement and taking three science courses. You might be the greatest scientist in the world, but you're taking three courses in the humanities and you're taking exploring diversity and on and on and on. And I think that prepares people for a world because there's a hell of a lot of failure. You know, the toughest things when I teach tutorials is to say, okay, we're going to constructively tear you apart. You know, you wrote the paper. I shouldn't use you. You're never right. You wrote the paper, Greg, and it's not a good paper. And I'm going to tell you how to improve that paper. And, you know, and that's, you learn. You learn not to be defensive, and you learn to take criticism well, to be a mensch about it. And you learn to say that, you know, as good as I am, I could be better, and I'm going to do that for someone else. And I think our students have that imprint on them. Well, I uh, will pick up on that because I actually have a tutorial twice a week. Uh, it's every Wednesday and every Sunday. And I, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I have an extremely tough tutor. Uh, her name is Ann Friedman. And, um, uh, and every once in a while, she gives me an F. And um, uh, when, because uh, my wife is my first uh, and most important editor. And uh, my, my actual copy editor knows that. And, um, uh, and every, you know, once in a while... Um, uh, the New Yorker did a, a profile of me in September and, and there was a funny scene where we were actually in northern Greenland um, uh, at Ice Core Research Station. We'd gone up there with Connie Hurtigard, the Danish um, Minister of Climate. And Ian Parker, the New Yorker mm -hmm. profiles, came along. Yeah. And we were sitting at the table and we were having this conversation about how Ann edits my columns. And, um, uh, and uh, I said, well, you know, probably... I mean, 98% of them she doesn't touch. And she said, 90%. And, um, <laughs> and of course, he ran that in. Yeah, no, it was there. It's a great profile if so, you haven't seen it. Uh, but um, you actually asked, a, a, I, I owe you a better answer to your question. And uh, Morty's answer really triggered it. Um, I've always said uh, what I do and what a hedge fund manager does, a global hedge fund manager, is very, is very similar. I'm a dot connector. And there's a real value in having people who are experts in dots, taking them deeper. And there's a real value in people who can connect dots. So I, I see disparate things in the world, and, I, and my mind is a pinball machine, which is connecting those dots all the time. So my value add is really that, that uh, I can have a conversation with you, and I'm connecting it right away to something that happened in Russia or something I read in the paper that day. And out of that, actually, that's where... That's where columns come from. Mm 
-hmm. And um, it's connecting dots uh, in ways that other people wouldn't. And I think that's where financial bets come from. And the only difference between me and you is I write a column, you make a financial bet. You're, you're long or short, a stock, a bond, or, or, or a currency. But you've gotten to that conclusion by doing what I call information arbitrage, where you're arbitraging all these different uh, perspectives. And Tom, that, that fits the, the paradigm that you um, explained during your last visit here when you talked about what skills will succeed in the increasingly flat world. There's skills that will be commoditized. That's one that won't be. Synthesizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, explaining was another yeah. one that you talked about. Yeah. Another one you talked about was being a superstar uh, in some particular yeah. area or something, uh, or in a skill that's particularly localized. Yeah. And that's a, a very good example yeah. of what you had been talking about. Question. One over here. Okay. okay. Hi, I just wanted to kind of, uh, Tom Friedman actually uh, s spoke earlier about the need for diversity, which is something that's been very important to me. Uh, and I've seen, I was a graduate of uh, this college in 1984, and it's a sea change in terms of diversity any way you want to uh, define it in terms of where the college is now versus where it was uh, when I graduated. Uh, back in the, literally in the dark ages as I see it now. But <laughs> by the same token, I wanted to expand upon that a little bit. And given this economic climate that we are now faced in, uh, I know I've talked to Morty about this, uh, and uh, I, I'm really interested in both of your perspectives in terms of socioeconomic diversity. College has come a long way um, from where it was. but. Given the pressures on the college and in liberal arts in general, where there are certain colleges that are going to be more committed to preserving and enhancing socioeconomic diversity than others, what steps should, what, what priorities or what values should the college place with respect to, the, to Williams in terms of preserving and hopefully enhancing socioeconomic uh, possibilities for? the wide array of, peop of, of, of students out there? Or should we, uh, perhaps given the issues that are now on the table with respect to certain economic issues, uh, move away from that um, for, you know, for perhaps a transitory period? I just would like your perspective on the <coughs> importance of uh, preserving socioeconomic diversity. Thank you. My time? Yeah, my yeah. turn. No Pulitzers. Okay. <laughs> you know, Ken, it's a great Next question. Question. It's not a real principle of an institution until it's tested. You know, in good times, you can say you're everything. You care about the environment. Mm -hmm. You care about being an engine of social mobility. You care about this and that. And then when the bad times come, economic turmoil, you know, the whole key is what do you keep and what do you cut? Uh, the board discussed that for three and a half hours last night at our budget meeting and there was one point of a, a complete agreement and that was continue to be need blind and meet full need for domestic students. Uh, uh, everything else is on the table pretty much. Uh, you know, we kept our commitment to uh, environmental standards and improvements, although we cut that budget, uh, but we still kept a, a real chunk in there because that's something that we feel that like we're making, we're doing a good job, but you know, when times are really tough, uh, you, you cut back in everything and you cut back. But the one thing that we're not touching is, is what you talked about. I mean, we've made tremendous strides. Uh, we're very proud of what we've done. And I think most importantly, Kendall, I mean, it, we, it gets back to what Tom said. How do you prepare people to succeed in a world so they're not outsourced, their job's not outsourced to Bangalore, right? As you put it, uh, you know, and, and, and the world is flat. You know, what do you do? And I think you have to make them comfortable with difference and you have to make them prepared to succeed in a world that's very different than the world I went into or you went into. Um, and it's a, it is a flattened world, and you better be able to not only understand difference, but to truly embrace it and make it not a liability but an asset. And that's just not on the table at Williams College. You know, we, we were proud of what we've done, and um, we're going to continue. That's our, the, what did the board say yesterday? Number one priority. But I'm you know, glad you asked that. that good. Just to 
pick up on, on something Morty said, and again, it, it just triggered up maybe a, an answer to Kendall's question, which is that um, uh, young people often come to me and say, God, I want to be a journalist, I want to be a columnist, when, what, do I, you know, what do I do? And um, what do I need to know? You know? And I said, well, it's good to be able to type 80 words a minute. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's good. I'm a really fast typer. And um, uh, got no English, you know, know your commas and punctuations and, and, and your dashes. Uh, that's important. Uh, good to know some economics and international okay. relations and politics. Yeah, that's, that, that's all good. Um, but there's actually just really one skill you need, I think, to be a, uh, I think to be a successful journalist. You have to like people. Uh, you really have to enjoy listening to the crazy things that people say and do. And, um, uh, and if you can't hear the music, you'll never be able to play the music. Hmm. And so uh, I, I personally, I really like people. I love sitting down talking to them, and I like hearing the things that they do. You'd be amazed how many journalists hate people. Um, and, uh, and frankly, it shows in, to me in their journalism. Um, but... Uh, it, it, and it, it's related to Morty's answer, though, and I think there is an education component here and to Kendall's question about socioeconomic diversity, which is that, um, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my career uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's no secret. I'm a little Jewish guy from Minneapolis, okay? But I've actually operated in the Arab world for 25 years. And um, anyone who's read my stuff knows that I didn't survive as a foreign correspondent and columnist in the Arab world by going around and telling people what they wanted to hear. Right. Um, I didn't survive there by saying, you're all wonderful, it's all the Israelis' fault, it's just great, I love you all, what can I do for you? Um, just the opposite, actually. And, uh, but I learned one really important lesson in doing that, and that is for me the single most important survival mechanism as a journalist in the Middle East was to be a good listener. Because listening is two things. First of all, it's a sign of respect. And if you listen to someone, whether they're an Iranian or a Palestinian, an Islamic fundamentalist or an Arab head of state, if you just give them, and you know there's two ways of listening, there's waiting for someone to stop talking and then there's actually listening. And, um, uh, and if you actually listen to someone, the most important aspect of that is it is a sign of respect. And if you show people the respect of listening to them, and maybe even saying, you know, I hear that, but I don't hear this, mm. it is amazing what you can say back to them. Because what you convey in that interchange is that you really want them to succeed. And that what you are criticizing, it's not because you want to get in their face or put them down. It's because ultimately you really want them to succeed. And believe me, people, and particularly minorities or victimized people, can smell that at a hundred <laughs> paces. And they know when someone is there to write about them and really wants them to succeed, and when they're there because they really want to put them down. And if you convey to someone that you want them to succeed, they will listen to you and your criticism all day long. And if you don't, you cannot tell them it is dark outside. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I think one of the things you learn, again, in this context that Morty's talking about of diversity and especially an intense small place like Williams, boy, I hope you learn how to be a better listener. Because mm -hmm. it's something that will really serve you well mm -hmm. in life, I think. Thanks, Tom. Steve Hardy. Speaking of uh, being one of the best listeners and enjoying people, uh, fellow trustee Steve, Steve Hardy. I want to give Steve a quick plug. Steve did the impossible. Those of you who have been to the Williams website uh, recently, uh, we, a couple of weeks ago, we posted the, the, the perspectives for the presidential position. Uh, and hopefully you had a chance to read it. If not, please, uh, please do. But Steve pulled out the, off the impossible is uh, having, having 16 people having, who all have 16 different ideas and are passionate mm -hmm. about this place, bringing it together in a way that is somewhat cogent and different and had a unique voice. And, and Steve, you did a masterful job uh, in, in doing that. So thank you on behalf of, on behalf of the college. Now your question. Thanks, thank Steve. Thank you. Completely unrelated to that. <laughs> uh, we're all familiar with the, um, the story of the Dutch boy with his finger in the dike and, you know, the, 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 the huge force of the sea trying to work its way through that dike. And um, we're talking about the liberal arts in the context of the global environment. And 
those of us who've had the privilege of a liberal arts education number, what, five million people in, in, in the United States and Western Europe and a couple of, scattered around a couple of other. And this against a, a global population of six billion people, many of whom are living on $2 a day um, and have no, um, no way of relating to the liberal arts. So I guess my question is, um, if you think of this as the grand scale of life in today's world, what gives us heart to think that these, this handful of people in a couple of Western democracies, you know, what is the point of leverage that we have to meaningfully engage people living on $2 a day in sub-Saharan Africa or in fundamentalist regimes of whatever stripe throughout the world or authoritarian regimes whose preoccupations are very different from Dryden and molecular biology and so on and so forth? What, what, how do you think of the mission of liberal arts in this global context and what influence can it meaningfully have over the, over the near term? You know, I, I'd, I'd say a couple things. Um, uh, you know, one is um, I think there's a, a big difference between uh, focusing on a snapshot and focusing on a trajectory of change. Um, and uh, there's a little bit in your question, it's a very important question, which is based on what I would call the snapshot. And, and what I mean is this. Uh, you know, I get this criticism sometimes from my writing about India. Friedman went to India, hung around with a few high-tech pals in Bangalore, came home and declared the world is flat. Um, uh, what he doesn't understand is that there's actually um, 800 million poor people in India. Uh, to which I always say, I hadn't noticed. Thank you so much <laughs> for telling me. You know, um, I completely missed it. I was there in emphasis, and I just, I just, I just completely missed it. Um, uh, my answer is what you don't understand, <clears throat> pal. I mean, to the critic, is um, that is what's new. What's new is that we're seeing the emergence of Indian engines to make Indians unpoor. Okay, and yes, if you take a snapshot of India, or you'll see few very rich people, a growing middle class, and, and millions of poor people. But if you look at the trajectory of change today, it's at a whole different angle. And it's being driven, and this is what's really new, not by the IMF, not by the World Bank, not by foreign aid, but by Indian innovators driving change. And that's really new, and that's really important. Now, so then step back and say, so what is this puny you know, liberal arts thing, maybe it's just 10 million or 5 million or maybe it's 50 million, but it's a drop in the bucket against 6.2 billion. But then, you know, um, go to the MIT Open University um, and go to MIT's Open University website. Uh, I've been part of that and I have a lecture up there. Um, and uh, it's just overwhelmed. It's overwhelmed by students taking courses. They, they can't get grades but they can actually take the exams, listen to the lectures uh, at MIT's Open University. Go to iTunes U. Um, look at the lectures now that are available there. So you can say, well, again, if you just look at the numbers, very small. Look at the trajectory, tra tra trajectory of change. The idea that someone can sit now in, forget Beijing, but in Xi'an or in Mysore in India or in, in somewhere in Africa, and if they've got enough bandwidth, listen to the greatest lectures on physics or science or math from MIT. Will it change the world overnight? No, nothing will. To which I always say, when was that moment in history where things changed overnight? Did I miss that period? <laughs> okay, so, you know, again, it's all about, are you taking a snapshot or are you looking at the trajectory of change and the engines driving that trajectory? And I find those engines very, very exciting and very different. Maybe just a different take, Steve. I mean, I, we're few in number, particularly the 26,000 Williams alums still alive, you know, right now and prospering. Uh, but we have a really a extraordinary impact. And, you know, one of the greatest honors I've had over the last nine years is awarding bicentennial medals, as you know, to uh, people. I remind the seniors that they're just representative of the broader group. And I, I just think of some of the people who have had such an impact on the 6.2 billion. You know, I think of the Williams alum who uh, eradicated smallpox from the world, honored four years ago. 
I mean, I think of the Williams alum last year who started the world's largest system of orphanages uh, in Mexico. I mean, I think of Alice Albright who started the vaccine fund and used her investment banking high-tech finance from her MBA program as a way to, you know, provide vaccines all over Africa. I mean, I think of the Williams alum who started Sesame Street. I mean, I think about, you know, you just think about all the impacts they have, and it's not just on the, the ones with $2 a day. You know, I mean, I got Glenn Lowry over here, a brilliant running MoMA, a brilliant representative of the Williams undergrads who went on to transform the art world, to enliven everyone's life. I think of Steve Sondheim. You know, you go on and on and on, and I'll tell you something, boy, the most... You know, of, of, I think about the 26 and we're so f small. Then I look at the enormous impact of those people and so many other ones to have on the world. And I think, my God, you know, you, you feel guilty because, you, you know, you have so many resources here and such an opportunity and the housing's so beautiful and the squash courts and the food's so organic and on. Mm -hmm. And I, thanks to you yeah, uh, and other Michael Pollan, yeah. you know, so and on and on and on. And I think, man, but what do we do with it? You know, we do great things with it. You know, we support the arts. You know, anything better than that. We support, you know, economic development. We, we just make the world a better place. And that's one thing I, I have to think that, Steve, if we had, you know, I, and I wish we had 100,000 Williams alums, and, and so did Amherst, and so did Swarthmore, and Bowdoin, and Middlebury, and Pomona, you know, across the liberal arts colleges, much less the Harvards, Princeton, Yale's, and on. And I think the world would be even better but I just think, where would the world be without our 26,000 alums and the ones who came before and the alums of similar schools? And that, I think, really justifies the kind, of, the kind of resources that we invest in a relatively small number. Great. Right here. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on that on a uh, question of scale and uh, performance. Uh, that is... You know, most of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies now do not come from schools like Williams. Uh, the president of Williams came from Hofstra. Uh, there is no longer that sort of exact path that we take pride in. We can anecdotally add up all those things and make a mm -hmm. case for us, but maybe there's not exactly data to prove that. Related to that is that question of scale. Um, Tom, uh, you have a child here. I gather you have a daughter, uh, a, a child at uh, Yale also. Had. She was a graduate. Had, okay. I kind of wish you had a third one at Michigan. Hmm. Um, comparatively, it could be a data set. <laughs> comparatively, did uh, one or two suffer in comparison to the other just based on size? We consider ourselves a gold standard of American education, the, the, the place that people look up to, and yet we can't lay down proof of that. Um, what, what gives the faith of that? Why are we still the gold standard? And is there the danger that you know, the gold standard of uh, trains in this country now, or in, in say, this hemisphere, our Orient Express tourist trains, that's not an accurate representation of rail passenger traffic uh, in America. That's a, a really thin slice, and it may be gold standard, but it may not be relevant to the way the rest of the commerce works. And I just wondered if you could reflect on, you know, it, well, if, if Williams is the right way to do it, you would have, um, I don't know, what, a million colleges in the world? You can't do that. How important is it? How, how do you make that compromise between scale and what works? Are we really the gold standard? Or um, are we really good at saying we are? Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marty, that's yours, baby. <laughs> well, I can go first. I, I'll go first, and then you answer. Because Paul, you, you had a number of things. First of all, I, I can do a promo that Paul is actually going to uh, preside over one of the six panels plus the lunch, so seven panels 
on the future of liberal arts. So, you know, you're going to get even more people to hear, because I know that's, we're going to be leading a wonderful Clayton and others uh, tomorrow in that session. I know you'll be talking about it, but just two things. One is that, um, and I've done some work on this, but a lot of other people have as well. I mean, it's, it's less actually likely um, to come out from different kinds of less prestigious schools and still get jobs at Goldman or ideally or even end up getting faculty jobs eventually at, at Williams, much less being president. I mean, there, there used to be, back 30 years ago, I graduated high school in 71, the, 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 there was a much wider distribution of uh, academic talent, broadly defined, than there is now. Uh, there has been a, a, a focus, there's a wonderful book by two economists, Cook and Frank, uh, called The Winner Take All Society. You've heard me talk about that, Paul. And um, If you look at simply the National Merit semifinalists, they used to be widely distributed across the Michigan states and Ohio states and the Iowa states and all in all. Now they're disproportionately in the Ivies and the Little Three and those kinds of things. So there's some data that show that would seem to indicate that um, there's going to be a greater concentration for the next generation to have come from a smaller number of schools. So that's a in kind of empirical thing. Uh, the thing about Yale and you're asking all that, you know, th there's one thing that is, is a, that's a little problem with that is that, you know, the reason why I think some of the research universities care more now about undergraduate education than they did 20 years ago is because of Williams and Amherst and Swarthmore and Bowdoin and Middlebury and Pomona. I, I think we set the gold standard. I really do. And I know you think that, too, because you contributed to the volume of Daedalus, the famous volume, distinctively American, the, the, the liberal, residential liberal arts college. was sort of the Bible on this thing. You had one of the chapters, as did I. And, you know, we, I, I think that, you know, there's a focus. And I saw this with my kids looking at different schools. They all say, well, you know, maybe we're not Williams and stuff. But we, we, you know, we have fewer grad students teaching. Maybe they're grading, but they're not doing the thing. And, you know, when I was at Penn, they never even thought about that. They threw me right in the classroom. I was a second-year graduate student, Ph.D. student. And, they, and I, they, I said, well, who am I teaching with? You know, who am I grading for? No, more, you, we need somebody pulled out. Uh, you're teaching your own section. I mean, even Penn, I don't think, does that anymore. I, you know, and why? It's because of the Williams of the world. I think we made them feel guilty about that. I, I think they're a little bit more focused on the undergraduate program outside the classroom as well as inside the classroom. So if we didn't exist, Paul, you know, it wouldn't be just that a small number, a couple hundred thousand students wouldn't have so-called ideal education, but we would take the pressure off because 15 million undergrads out there and a couple hundred thousand at most go to our kinds of schools. But I think we really spill over to many, many more. I, say, I think we're now the leaders. Uh, in my class, we read uh, more Hopkins and a lot. Fred Rudolph's brilliant book, his old dissertation from Yale, right? And, and, you know, in that, it really is remarkable that when Charles Elliott in 1890 was president of Harvard, he and his fellow Ivy presidents, pre-Ivy, but re recent university, they set the curriculum. You know, they were the ones who figured out you know, every, everything, requirements, I mean, and now they look to us. And, you know, one of the nicest things when, you know, Harvard redid their undergraduate program in a very, very nice way was a quote from Peter Gomes, who was an honorary degree, he spoke at Baccalaureate, the breathtakingly brilliant chaplain, and he, and he had this great line saying that we could be Harvard, we could be Williams and be Harvard too. And that's nice, and it's flattering, but more importantly than that, because I have a daughter there, I mean, I think one reason why they're, arguably, I think, much more serious about what they do for undergrads now than they did 20 or 30 years ago. It's because of Williams. Because they want to be Williams in Harvard, and they want to be Williams in Yale. Mm. And if your daughter at Yale didn't have such a different experience, she would have if she didn't have Williams for, Har for Yale to try to emulate. Now uh, you answer. I, I think you've said it all. I, it, it's a little out of my skill set. So I'm gonna, <laughs> no, I think it's a very, very good answer, Marty. See, if you're going to be a professor, nothing's out of your yeah. skill set. It might be out of your skill set, but yeah. not out of your speaking set. No, no. It's exactly. the difference. Just one I haven't really... Corey, I absolutely agree with that. I, in fact, I've gone around the country as a co-chair of the campaign yeah. making exactly absolutely. that pitch. Yeah. Um, how do you... Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, you can look at, you know, where people, how they succeed, and you can tell those kinds of stories. You know, I think ultimately, Paul, it's, and we talked about this in the board today, ultimately, I think you need some kind of outcomes assessment. Now, I, I think you need it 
maybe to prove that we provide the kind of value added we all know we do, but we can't quantify it. But I think it's even more, especially in hard times, going to Kendall's point. You know, Kendall, I wouldn't rather, you know, keep our commitment to diversity, keep our commitment to inclusion and all those things, and we will, but I wish I had more data so I could better allocate the resources at Williams into ways that maximize the accumulation of human capital. And I wish I knew that the expensive decision to add small writing sections really makes people write better. And I wish I knew that the quantitative requirements really pay off. I wish I knew that the exploring diversity requirement is paying off, because that takes a lot of resources. I suspect that the 70 tutorials, because we can follow them up, seem to be paying off. But, you know, until you really go into the world of outcomes assessment, you're never really going to have proof. But it's a tough sell, and it's a tougher sell, despite Secretary of Education Spellings and Charles Miller and all It's a tougher sell, obviously, at the Williams. And I think it's not because we're afraid, Paul, that we're not delivering what we promise in the view book. It's just that we think sometimes too much about the mystical character, you know, quality of imbuing integrity and creativity, and you can't measure that. You know, I think there are tests that can try to get at those things. And I think eventually it's going to be good because it didn't happen during my presidency. It might not happen during my successor's presidency, but it's going to eventually happen. And I think we're going to have a better story than just anecdotes because I know in my heart and soul that we're delivering it and I would love to have the uh, outcomes that can really prove it. So I'm not, and I know you're going to talk about that on your panel tomorrow. Okay. Morty, I'm getting the, the cut sign from uh, the, the powers that be. I think we have time for, for, uh, for one more question. One more. Uh, and and uh, But there's one hand at the very, at the very the back, back there. Can't. Thanks. can't see who it is. I think it's on, Susie. You just got to keep talking. I'll turn it on. I'm wrong again. My name's Susie Camp, and I work at I Can Turn. Oh, that's woo! My name is Susie Camp, and I work at a graduate school that is opening up campuses in five. Thank you, five different countries, and the objective is that over time, if you look at what the goals are of the School of Business, is that at 100,000 feet, what will be going on in country in Dubai, in China in India, St. Petersburg, Russia, and in London will come back and impact the way students are learning in Durham and what they're learning. So if Williams, of course, we're not opening up campuses across the world, what are we doing so that in the liberal arts context we're making the classics, the, the math classes, the econ classes, looking out more in a global context? Well, Susie, you know, it's a good question and that we, we have far from kind of unanimity on the board. You might very well get a next president who's much more uh, anxious to open up other campuses and to do joint the kind of partnerships uh, than I have been. And maybe it's my failing or maybe it's my vision. You know, history will show. I, I have nothing against the research universities doing those kinds of things. And, um, but I, I just, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of their ability to truly pull it off. And it gets back to what something Tom mentioned about before, you know, about the size and the intimacy, and it's very tempting when people are willing to build you a campus in Singapore and then give you a billion dollars to run it, but, you know, are you going to control the quality of your name or your product? I think what's magical about us is we're nestled here in the Purple Valley. You know, we have 255 tenure-track, tenured professors who are just, it's their lives and they're dedicated to it. We have a small number of students, you know, they're all living right here on campus. You know, and I agree, it's great that half the juniors go abroad, you know, and that's really nice. But, I, you know, I, it's, there's certain things I find hard to replicate. And I, I think that my view has been kind of diverting our focus on, you know, our, our campus in Bangalore or something, even if it's a so-called freebie, you know, isn't really fulfilling our public mission for the country or for the world, but you know, maybe somebody else. I wouldn't say it doesn't work for some research universities, for some professional schools, but I think the magic of Williams, why you fell in love with it as parents, as alumni, in many cases as both, you know, it wasn't about that. You know, it was about what happened to you here, 
what happens to you on the weekends with the comfortable and uncomfortable learning. It's our sides. It's our undergraduate focus. It's the brilliant faculty. I love what Tom said before. You know, a number of you took some of my weirder courses in uh, economic demography, and I, I can't tell you how gratified it is to still speak to some former students, and again, some in the room now will say, you know, I, when I was studying the economics of birth control in Africa, which was mainly what my economic demography course was about, um, I thought, how is that going to help me at Goldman? How is that going to help me at Skadden? How is that going to help me as a doctor? How is that going to help me? I'm just thinking people in the room who took that course. Uh, and, and the reality is it did help them because it wasn't about the material. It was about an infectious love of learning, right? And it was about giving them a chance to succeed, giving them a chance to fail. And I think that's what it's really about. And it's not about where it happens. It's about how it happens, and I think that's what Williams is about. But I want Tom to get the last word about him, because when I was really thinking about, you know, as all these people open up and Williams, I mean, I talked to you a little bit about it, and we talked about it when I did that event, and you and Ann nicely came and, uh, in, in D.C. two years ago, and, you know, you had some interesting things to say about what is the comparative advantage of Williams, and, and where should they focus their attention? Uh, well, you know, it, again, it's it, it's a little out of my league, but I, I would just say this morning, you know, um, if I translate it into my own life, um, I, I just could not agree more with your attitude. And for me, the translation is, I don't blog. Okay. I write a column twice a week in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. um, that's my currency. Mm -hmm. And I would never debase my currency. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when I'm reacting to something on the spot, you know, in 10 seconds or in the immediacy. Mm -hmm. You tend to, in my universe, um, uh, you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think you dilute your brand and ultimately you, you diminish the value of your currency. Your currency is the totality of the experience here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go into the education branding business, that's another business, mm -hmm. you know. And I think ultimately it would diminish the very special thing that you have here. Uh, that's what I feel about um, my own life, you know, that, uh, you know, I, I write this column. It, I, it, my reputation rises or falls on that column. I put everything into it. I take it very seriously, but I'm not trying to be uh, the new, new thing. I don't blog. I don't Twitter. I don't, uh, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not, um, uh, I don't do any of that stuff. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually very old-fashioned and, and getting more so all the time. And um, uh, as, is, as is my wife. My one concession to modernity is that I read the paper online. My, my wife reads the hard copy and tells me everything I missed. Um, and, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I guess my, my last line would be this. You know, it's, it's really easy, and I see this, frankly, more and more. We were, I'm on the Pulitzer board. And we actually had a, uh, uh, I've just come from New York, as Morty knows. We spent the last three days judging the Pulitzer Prize. It's a great, it's the world's greatest book club. And um, we had a big argument. Um, I can't go into detail of this, but it, it just, it, it's both inside the meeting and outside over, you know, how much do you bring in of online things and, 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 uh, and things of that nature. And, and I get to ask this question a lot in public, you know, uh, by people, um, uh, you know, is the New York Times, you know, uh, you know, well, why don't you blog? Why don't you Twitter? Why don't you have video on your column and, and, and all of that stuff? And, uh, you know, my view is very simple that um, I think the more wired the world gets, the more interconnected the world gets, the more our kids actually interact on this, you know, global playing field nakedly. You're not there when your daughter's online. I'm mm. not there when my, my, mm. my daughters are online. I, I, you know, um, uh, you, you're, you're not there when your kids are on Facebook. I'm not there when my kids are on Facebook. Um, so what's happened in this world is you've got all these people now um, interconnecting, but, but doing it, there's no filter. Mm. And the Internet is an open sewer of untreated, unfiltered information. But it's the reality. It's the new world. Mm. And I think your job, my job, a parent's job, is to instill those filters. You know, mm. I, I wrote a long time ago, if I had one wish, it, this was in the days of modems, um, it was that every modem sold in America would come with a warning from the Surgeon General. <laughs> um, and it would say, judgment, 
not included. Okay. <laughs> um, judgment not included. And that's, that's your job. That's hopefully yeah. my job as a columnist, is to help people navigate those judgments. So, you know, my bottom line is that the more wired the world gets, the more that all that old-fashioned stuff, all those values that you learn in church, synagogue, temple, mosque, um, values of reading, writing, arithmetic, all of what we consider the fundamentals, the old-fashioned stuff, it has none of the sizzle of Twitter and it has none of the, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the sex appeal of all this new technology. Those basic fundamentals matter more than ever mm. and you can't download them. You can only upload them the old-fashioned way in a classroom, under the olive tree, you know, with teachers and students, um, good professors, good spiritual leaders. It's all the old-fashioned stuff. It matters so much more than ever. So, uh, you know, what you do with your campus and your brand uh, is up to you, but man, um, I'm with you all the way on preserving what you got here. Thanks, Dale. Thank you. Couldn't Natty, did I embarrass you, honey? <laughs> <laughs> Any more than normal? Yes. <laughs> Mimi, did I embarrass you, honey? Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, we, we couldn't ask for a better closing statement than, than that. And, and thank goodness, and on behalf of everybody in this room, thank goodness you write your columns, your books. Oh, thank you. Our lives have been enriched. Not everyone Our, feels that way, but I appreciate the thought. <laughs> <laughs> Our lives have been enriched, and we've been challenged, and we've been informed, and Thanks we thank so you for My that. Pleasure. Thank you for spending your, your precious time with us tonight. And Morty, equally on behalf of everybody in this room, thank goodness that you've been the president of this college for, for nine years, and thank you for sharing the stage. It's been a privilege to be up here with you both, and on behalf of the, of, the, of the audience, we want to thank you again. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. That was great. Thanks.